Are you good? Sure good to see you guys. I didn't know if you'd come or not. How many of you decided like last night, kind of last thing, yeah, we'll go. How many of you are still undecided, but you found yourself here anyway? <laughs> this past week started out like most other weeks in our lives, and that is, you know, Monday, we got up, went to work, went to school, did our jobs. If we're retirement, you know, we're in that routine, whatever it is that we do, it was kind of a normal week. And the coronavirus thing, which has been in the news, as you know, for a long time now, it was kind of, in my mind anyway, it was like it's over there, and it was sort of out of sight, out of, in the back of my mind. Not completely out, but it was in the back of my mind. And then things started happening over here, and, you know, the NCAA shuts down, and the NBA shuts down. And, man, when this country shuts down sports, you know something's going on. That's exactly right. And so businesses started shutting down and schools closing and the stock market went crazy and, you know, just on and on and on. And so as the week formed uh, or kind of progressed, we found ourselves kind of going back to the drawing board going, well, you know what? Maybe what we had planned is not really the best thing. It's not the most timely thing. So I called Pastor Rob and our three of our four elders. One is in Florida, so he wasn't in on the call, but there were five of us on the call. And we just talked about this situation that's going on in the U.S. currently. And by the way, one of our elders is a medical doctor. So he has the advantage and we have the advantage not only of him being an elder, but he's also a medical doctor and he is the head of a medical clinic. So uh, he kind of knows a little stuff about this. And so we were talking to him and he said, yeah, it's blown out of proportion. Yes, we need to use common sense, all the stuff that the CDC and others are telling you to do, do those things but it's really way over the top in what really is going on. But here's the net result. The net result, regardless of how serious it is, risen, who has it, don't have it, died, didn't, you know, the truth of the matter is the net result is panic and it's fear and it's worry and folks are, you know, buying up toilet paper and can't find the hand sanitizer. And I saw an ad on the news last night for some face mat, the mask that you can buy for $5,000 if you want some of those. And so, it's, I mean, that's just kind of the way that it is. And so what we felt like the thing to do this morning would be to come and give an answer to the pandemic from God's word as best we can. Now, you may or you may not know this, but this book is absolutely chock full of stories of men and women since recorded history who have faced pestilence, war, famine, disease, invasion, exile, evil, and on and on and on. Because last I checked, and you too, we live on a fallen planet. We always have. We always will till Christ returns. And so this kind of stuff is part and parcel for what happens in life on a fallen world. And you know that. But here's the thing that I got to, I sort of asked myself this question, and that is, what changed, what's different since last Sunday? What's different since last Sunday? Circumstantially, a lot of things are different since last Sunday. We just mentioned a few of those. But what in God's nature and what in God's promises have changed since last Sunday? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. This pandemic thing didn't catch God off guard. Not only does he knew it was coming, he knows the way through this. And so we're gonna, what we're going to do today is we're just going to walk through some verses. Now, we started a series three weeks ago called Your Blessed Life. And it may be with all the stuff going on circumstantially that you're finding yourself struggling with, is my life really blessed? Is it still blessed in the midst of what's happening in my circumstances? And I think God's word will answer that this morning. So what I want to do is go old covenant on you. I want, to, I want to go in the Old Testament portion of the Bible, and I want to talk first about a guy named Jeremiah. Now, here's what I can tell you. If I were you, and I'm one of you, I would get my card out, that little handout out, and I don't know what notes are on it or whatever, but we're not going to pay attention to that today. But get you a pen ready, because what I am going to do is show you what God's Word says to you, what God's Word promises you. I, to be honest with you, I could not wait. I had a hard time going to sleep last night. I couldn't wait to get here to be with you, to share these things with you. Because in times like this, as times get darker, God's light shines brighter. And I'm not just saying that. It absolutely is true. And so I want to share some things with you from God's Word today. I believe you'll find comfort. I believe you'll find encouragement. I believe you'll find hope. I believe you'll find some tools not only for yourself and your family, but for the people that are around you freaking out or quietly living in desperation and they don't know what to do. So I'm in Jeremiah, if you can find that. He was one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. He lived between five, six and 500 B.C., 
And his job, he's called the weeping prophet. His job was 40 years long. He was a prophet for 40 years. And for 40 years, he preached and taught, and the people never responded to him. They never repented. They never paid any attention to him. In fact, they threw him in jail and did all kinds of stuff to him. So he didn't have a very enviable life. And yet, he did what it was that God called him to do. He was a prophet to the the nation of Judah. And Judah... Uh, basically had turned their back on God again and again and again and again, year after year after year after year. And so when, I, when we pick up the story in the 17th chapter uh, of Jeremiah, he's talking about how God sees man anyway. Regardless of circumstances, the pandemic or whatever's going on, here's what he wrote through Jeremiah. This is what he said. He said in verse 5, I'm in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 17 Verse 5, and it says, it says, thus says the Lord. In other words, this is coming from God. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. He's not saying you can't trust people. He's not saying don't be a person of integrity and don't take each other at, at our face value and our word and that sort of thing. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is the person that puts their ultimate trust in man, the person that looks to man instead of God to be their deliverer is cursed, actually. That's really what he's saying here. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. This person, male or female, looks to people. Maybe that's Facebook, maybe that's CDC, maybe that's Donald Trump, maybe that, and I'm saying, yeah, let's pay attention to all those things. Fox News, let's watch, let's be informed, but let's don't become people that are engaged so, and we're just so immersed in the culture, and that we take our cues from man, mankind, that we, we get all of our direction and instruction and help and hope and everything from man, because what God says, and he said a long time ago, is that mankind that puts their trust in man is going to be cursed, okay? It's not a good thing. If I were to ask you, pop quiz here for you, somebody probably knows the answer to this. I learned this years ago. If I were to ask you to turn to the verse in the Bible that's in the exact center of the Bible, where would you turn? If you knew that, somebody's probably Googling it already. Yeah, it's the book of Psalms. Do you know which verse it is? It's chapter 118, Verse 8, here's what it says. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. That's in the very center of the Bible. And here we have Jeremiah sometime later saying, hey, it's not a good idea to put your ultimate trust in man. And whether that man is yourself or that man is the government or that man is the CDC or that man is... And again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not downplaying I love the fact that we got the CDC. I love the fact that we got medicine and doctors and wash our hands and hand sanitize. We should take advantage of all of that, but we shouldn't build our lives around that, and our well-being should not be dependent upon those things. That's the idea that Jeremiah is saying here. Then he says this. He's going to tell us what a person like this, a cursed person, this is what they're like from God's point of view. In verse 6 he says, and it's a metaphor. He's not saying the person is, but a person is like. For he will be like a bush in the desert, and he will not see when prosperity comes. But he will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Doesn't sound like a very enviable position to me to be in. So he's talking about, he says, this person is going to have a barren life. They're going to be empty, basically, lifeless. And a bush is temporary. Even, no matter how long it lasts, it's only temporary. But he says this in verse 7. Watch this. This is the part you came for. He says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. And and for years, I didn't understand what that meant. I, I mean, I thought I knew what it means to trust in the Lord, but I didn't understand the difference between trusting the Lord and trusting in the Lord. And finally, the Lord just kind of revealed it to me one day. It's been some time ago, but he showed me. Let me show you what what I'm talking about. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. That's salvation. That's salvation. That's where you come to him and you repent of your sins and you turn your life over to him and you trust in him for salvation and you establish the relationship at that point. And whose trust is the Lord is ongoing. It means not only am I saved, 
Now I'm looking to him to continue to give me direction. I continue to get my strength. He is my source. I find energy. I find power. I find answers. I find help. I find comfort. I find everything I need, not in just a salvation experience back whenever, but it is an ongoing lifestyle that I have. That's what he's referring to here. Blessed is the person who, turn, who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is is the Lord. Then he gives a metaphor for this person. He says, for he will be like a tree, not a bush. Bush is kind of temporary. Tree is far more permanent. He will be like a tree planted by the water. What is the significance of a tree planted by water? It has a source. The source of what? Life. Water is life. And that's what he's trying to say here. A person that's blessed of God, trusts in God, it's like a tree that's planted by water. And so he has the source of life. Look at this. He says, the tree also extends its roots by a stream. What does that mean? It means that even a tree has the good sense to give the effort enough to extend its roots toward the stream, right? It wasn't planted in the stream. It's planted by the stream. So it extends its roots. In other words, there is effort involved in following God. There is effort involved in following God. God will always, always do his part. All you have to do is trust him and you have to seek him. That's what Jesus said in the New Testament. But the, it does require some effort on our part. You have demonstrated that already this morning. How do I know? Because you're sitting here. You're sitting here. You could be thousands of other places right now, but you chose to be here. So you are demonstrating that you are extending your roots out to God. And guess what? He's extending back to you, and he gives you life. That's what he promises here. And watch this. And he will not fear when the heat comes. Have you ever seen a tree afraid? Of course not. It's a metaphor again. But he says that when the heat comes, he won't be afraid. In other words, and the heat always comes. Well, what is heat? It can be any number of things. That's why he didn't specify, well, if these three things happen. No, he said, when the heat comes, and the heat always comes. I've said for years, I learned this years ago, I've found it to be true. And that is that you're either in the midst of a problem right now, or you just got out of a problem, or you're headed into a new problem. And that's all there is in life. That's all there is in life. The heat always comes. It may let up for a season, but I guarantee you, you know, and the word tells us, the heat is on its way again. Challenges, stresses, pressures, they are constant in this life. That's life on a fallen planet. But you know what? He says the tree doesn't wilt. The tree doesn't give up. The tree doesn't die. The tree is planted by the streams of water. It has life. The, the water's flowing into the tree. And so what happens? Its leaves will be green. No matter what happens, circumstantially, pandemics, invasion, war, all cancer, you name it, the leaf on the tree is going to be green no matter what's happening externally. What is this a reference to? It's a reference to the fact that life is lived from the inside out, not the outside in. We do so much about our bodies and how we look and how much we weigh and how much, you know, on and on and on. And that's good. I'm all for it. I mean, I'm the best I got right here. This is it. I shaved. I washed my hair. These clothes are clean. That's all I got. That's all I got. But here's the thing, this body's passing away. Your body is passing away. But you know what? On the inside of me, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, though our outer man is decaying day by day, our inner man is being renewed. We're getting stronger on the inside. Jeremiah talked about it in the Old Testament. It's full in the New Testament. It's all over the place. God wants us to get the idea that your leaf is not going to wither because you have life on the inside. You are connected to the source of life, and he's giving you life right? And so your leaf doesn't wither. Not only that, you don't fear, he says, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought. Again, talking about a tree, using a metaphor. He says the tree's not going to be afraid when it gets hot and the heat comes and the pressure shows, and he's not going to be anxious or worried in a year of drought. In other words, you will go through seasons in your life that things are dry, things are hard, things are difficult. I'm looking at a lady right there that said to me recently through a text, I battled cancer for over 10 years, over 10 years. And she's beat it again and again and again. That, my friend, is a season of drought. That is a season of drought, right? But she's not worried. The Bible says you won't be anxious. Will you have anxious moments? 
Yes. Is it okay to be afraid? Is it okay to be worried? In moments, yeah, it is. If you look at the circumstances, if that's where you get your cue, if that's the source of your well-being is Facebook, my friend, you're in trouble. If he is who you're trusting in, you won't wilt. Your leaf won't turn green. You won't fade away. You won't die of fear. You won't be worried to death. That's what it says right here. You will not be anxious in a year, a whole season, whatever that season is of drought. Watch this, last phrase here. Nor cease to yield fruit. Fruit. In other words, everything has reasons. And part of the reason you're still here is God wants to bear fruit through your life. And the way that happens is you stay connected. You keep your roots in the stream. And the stream flows into your roots. The sap gives you life, keeps your life green from the inside out, and you bear fruit. What fruit? All kinds of fruit. We all know, you know, love, joy, peace, all that. Kindness, witnessing, love, great. I mean, on and on and on and on and on it goes. Okay? Now, what is the key in these verses? Five, six, seven, eight, four verses. What's the key? By the way, how many paths are there in this? How many different? There are two. Yeah, you're cursed or you're blessed, dependent or independent. Either way, that's all there is. Here it is again. Here it is again. What is the key? It's who you trust in. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. It's up to you. What is another word for trust? Another Bible word for trust. It's faith. It's faith. You have to have faith. Well, I don't have very much faith. What is faith? Glad you asked. This is where you get your pen and your card out because I'm going to go through some things for you. And if I were a doctor, and I'm not, not that kind of doctor, I would give you a prescription, and the prescription, I'm about to, we're going to write the prescription right now. Are you ready? Because here's the thing, if you hear a message here today, and let's say you like it, let's say, yeah, that sounds pretty good. By Wednesday, you won't remember most of what we talked about. I'm telling you, that's a fact. That's why the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory, okay? So here we go. What what, what is faith? Let's go to Hebrews 11.1. Hebrews 11.1. We're going to try to put these on the screen for you so you can see them and you can actually write them down. Here's faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, I'm not going to try to teach all these verses to you today because we don't have that much time. But if I give you the tool, you can take the tool and you can meditate on the tool and ponder on it and Say it back to yourself and pray it to God and talk with your life group. And what you find is these things become part of your thinking and part of your nature. And what happens is over time, as this happens, the false narratives that every single one of us have, meaning false things we believe about life, about God, about people, about circumstances, those things get rooted out and the new, the truth replaces the false narrative. We get true narratives. The Bible is the truest of narratives. It's God's word. God doesn't lie. Okay, so what is faith? If I need faith, if the key to this story in Jeremiah uh, is faith, it's trust, what is faith? It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay, that's what faith is. Verse 11 or verse 6 of that same verse says this, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a what, church? He's a what, church? He's a rewarder of those who seek him. Without faith, you can't please him. How many of you are interested in pleasing God? How many of you are interested in pleasing God? If you are, raise your hand. If you want to please God, it takes faith, right? And so he says, for he who comes to God or she must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. As you seek him, he rewards you, right? The tree that extends its roots by the stream, right? The tree gets rewarded with life. 
you get rewarded. That's what that is saying. Romans 10, 17, here's what it says. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's why it's so important that we go to church. It's so important that we read our Bibles. It's so important that we have exposure to the word of God, whether that's podcasts throughout the week, if that's praise and worship music, if you have your daily Bible time, whatever it is, it's important because everything is trying to tear your faith down in this world. Everything that's not of God is trying to tear your faith down, and it does a good job. All you have to do is stop looking at what God says. All you have to do is stop trying, stop seeking, and I promise you that you will go the way of the world. You absolutely, you can't help it. That's why your faith has to be continually built up. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's why we say almost every single Sunday, read your Bible, not because it's good for us and we want you to and we check a box if you read your Bible, but because it'll change your life. That's why. Amen? Here's something for you. How about James 4, 8? James 4, 8. What does it say? Draw near to God. How? I can't see him, right? I can't shake hands with him. I can't hear his voice. I can't touch him. Draw near to God. So how do I draw near to God? By faith. By faith, we trust him. Draw near to God, and what's he going to do? He's going to draw near to you. You realize, I mean, you see what you have? Do you see what you have? What you've been given? God Almighty, who owes us nothing, says, I'll come near to you. Just come near to me. I'm interested in you. I know you're scared. I know that you're worried. I know about your kids. I know about your porn addiction. I know about everything there is to know about you. Come to me anyway. And I'll draw near to you. That's what he says. How about this one? Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy. You need mercy today? You need grace today? Absolutely. And what does this say? Come with your tail between your legs groveling before God because he's, you know, can't stand the sight. That's not what it says. His own word says, come with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. When is a time of need? (laughs) Every day, every day. Listen, when you start thinking you don't need him, you're in trouble. That's dangerous. But he's inviting you. He's not saying, hey, do you have an appointment? You don't get a busy signal if you call him. He's always ready. He's always ready to receive you. How about this one? Matthew 28, 20. I love this one. One of the most helpful verses I ever learned years and years and years ago. Last part of verse 20. This is the Great Commission. Jesus is saying these words and he says, lo, I'm with you always. Even to the end of the age. When is always? Monday before we got news of everything shutting down, was he with us then? Thursday and Friday when everything's shutting down, was he with us then? Is he with us this morning? Will he be with us tomorrow and next week and next month and next year? All the way to the finish line, if you're born again, if you put your faith, your trust in him, he goes with you you. He is not a reluctant participant. He thought about it. He chose you. He lives in you, and he always will. Listen, God plus one is always the majority. Always. Always. Hebrews 13.5 says something similar. God says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. When is never? When is never? Church, not a trick question. When is never? Never, right? So he's always going to be, he said, I'm always going to be with you. Never will I leave you nor forsake you. Verse 8, same chapter. What does he say? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. The stock market changes. Your 401 changes. Right? Right? Your job can change. Your health, everything changes that's alive down here. He doesn't change. He can't get any better. 
He can't improve. He's God. Is it starting to dawn on you? What you have access to? Jesus said these words in John 16, verse 33. He said, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, what? I've overcome the world. He said that right before he was crucified, knowing it was coming. Allowed himself to be crucified. Allowed himself to die for three days. Knowing three days later, what was he going to do? Rise from the dead. He had the power to come back from the dead. Listen, if he can do that, can't he get us through this? These things I've spoken to you so that in me, there's the key. You don't have this if you're not in him. In Meaning, in relationship with him. Just knowing about him is not, it's not going to do it for you. These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Do you have peace this morning? Really and truly. Not faking, not, yeah, kind of, sort of. Yeah, but I'm kind of, you know, I'm a little uh, antsy. Do you have peace? In the world you have tribulation. Is that true? In this world you always have tribulation. You always, I always, we always have tribulation. But take courage. I've overcome the world. I came down here. I was born as a baby. Lived a sinless life. Died a death, was really dead, and came back to life. So I went before you. I did it before you so I could show you what it's like when you get to that point in your life. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Death's not the end. It's a transition. It's graduation. Can you imagine? I mean, this is America. Like I said a few weeks ago, we're in Oklahoma. This is about as good as it gets on this planet. Can you imagine that this was all there was? And there's not. It's not. There's something way better. And the key is in Jesus. That's what he's saying. The key is with Jesus. John 14, 16 says this. I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper that he may be with you forever. Who's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. Listen, when Jesus says, I'll be with you always, he wasn't faking. That wasn't a metaphor. That wasn't like, well, you know, sort of, but what I really mean. No, he's going to be with us forever in the power, the person of the Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. He's with you now. If you have put your faith in Christ, if you've surrendered your life to him, the Holy Spirit lives in you now. You say, well, yeah, but I've done a lot of bad stuff. So what? So have I. He still lives in you. He still lives in you. Think about, come on, come on. All this bad stuff and, you know, but God's living in you? Really? Well, if you believe what he says, and can I tell you something else? Even if you don't believe what he says, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're having, if you're rocky right now and you're struggling, it's okay, but it doesn't change the fact that he lives inside you. Because he chooses to. Are you glad? Man, I'm thrilled. How about this one? John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, Jesus speaking. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Can you get peace in this world? I ain't found it. Not peace. I give to you, not as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Did you know that there are 365 places in the Bible that says fear not? Isn't that coincidental? 365 fear nots in the Bible. How many days of the year are there? 365 days, one for every single day. It's as though God knew that we were going to struggle with this one. So he made sure that he got it covered. How about this one? Philippians 4, 6. Philippians 4, 6. Stay with me now. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything, in other words. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't worry, but do pray. And while you're praying, be thankful. That's what he's saying. Let your requests be made known to God. And here's what's going to happen when you do that. Verse 7. And the peace, there it is again, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Well, I can't figure out 
why all these bad things are happening and all this stress and people are panicking and freaking out and going crazy and, you know, cashing in their 401s and putting everything in, you know, T-bill, whatever. But I'm okay. I, I just have this weird peace that it's going to be okay because I prayed about it and I've surrendered it to the Lord and so he's got it. And the truth is he's had it the whole time, even when there wasn't a pandemic, okay? So this is true. This is where we usually stop. Let me show you the next verse, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, do what? Dwell on these things. So again, if you spend five minutes looking at the Bible and you spend five hours reading Facebook or watching the news, or dialoguing with each other about what you think the market's going to do or what's closing next or what's going to happen to your job. And I, Listen, I'm not saying that we can't do that. You, we can choose to do that. What I'm saying is God tells us if you want peace, this is where you find it. Don't spend the bulk of your time listening to the world because it will bring you down. It will rob you of your peace. He says, but these things, what, what things would these be? The things that God tells us about. If you know the Bible, if you've got it memorized, and you probably don't need to worry about this, but if you kind of are not all that familiar with it yet, this would be really helpful. And I'm not being sarcastic. I don't mean to be ugly. I'm just saying, guys, this stuff really works. This is why I couldn't wait to get here today. I couldn't wait to tell you this. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but I tell you what I'm doing with it, and it makes all the difference in my world. All the difference. So if we stop at 8, we could also look at 9. What does 9 say? Paul gets personal here. He says, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. You need to look at the right kind of models in your life. And I don't mean, you know, bikini models. I'm talking about people who are trying to follow Jesus. Look at those people. Listen to those people. Because what, when you do that, peace is what follows that, okay? Okay, let's go OT on you. Let's go Old Covenant. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 30. I love this. I love this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. He, his understanding is inscrutable, meaning it's mysterious. You can't and I can't understand the things of God because he's outside of our understanding. Next verse. He gives strength to the weary. Are you weary? He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Next. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Man, is that not, is that, that, doesn't that, I mean, does that not boost your sails? Doesn't that pick you up? My goodness. So good. We could have just talked about that. That would have been plenty for today. But how about this one? Isaiah 41.10. Don't fear. Do not fear. Why? Because I'm with you. Don't anxiously look about you. Why? Because I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Don't fear because I'm with you. Yeah, but isn't all this bad stuff still happening? Yeah, it is. But he's inside you. And he gives you what you need to face whatever comes. That's what he's promising. Okay? So we've looked at prayer, we've looked at the Word, we've looked at faith, we've looked at the Holy Spirit. How about this one, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Real quick, let me cover this one. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and the, of God's household. Next verse. Having been built on the foundation, that's a nice word, of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Next in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Next. In whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. What is that about? 
It's about the church. It's about what God's doing, what God's building. And nothing's going to tear it down. Nothing's going to take it away. It's going to outlast everything else. Not because I say so, but because that's what God is doing. And that's his agenda to the end of time. To the end of time, you're a part of something that's going to outlast everything else. Feel good about that. I hope. I do. I feel great about that. How about this one? Acts 2, 42. I'm, going to, I'm just going to read through it real fast, and I'm going to tell you what this is about. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. They're describing what life groups did. Next verse. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Next. And all those who had believed were together and held all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart and praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's a description of the early church. That's the kinds of things that they did with each other. That's what we do in our life groups. That's our goal. Our goal is not just to get together and talk about the weather and the Sooners. That's cool, but that's not all there is to life. Those things give life. That's like having your roots expanded out to the streams of water. It breathes life into you. That's why we have life. We don't have life groups to corral everybody and say, well, we had 30 this time. No, that's not, that's not it. But we know that life is lived best with each other. It's lived best in community, and we need that. And I know we got to, how many can we have and don't have over 250, and I, we respect that. And going forward, whatever our government tells us they want us to do, we will adhere to that, right? We're not rebels, but we just happen to be right under the, that barrier currently. So we're good. We're good. So what I'm saying is you have the Holy Spirit, you have prayer, you have Jesus, you have the church, you have life groups, okay? What about this one? And I skipped these, so I'm going to throw them a curve. Romans 8, 28. I love this. Romans 8, 28. What does it say? And we know that God calls us all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God causes all things to work together for good. It's so important for us to know that because so much of life we look at and we interpret it and we go, how, how is this considered good? Or how's God going to make good come out of this? And it can be the worst. You murdered somebody, abortion. I mean, we could just go down the list. Pandemic, lost my job, blah, on, divorce, on, and adultery, on and on and on. And yet... God promises to make good come out of all things in the lives of the children that belong to him. That's what he promises. And this is the last one I'll share with you today before we pray. Romans 8, same chapter, verse 35. Here's what he says. He will, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress, or persecution, or fame, or famine, I mean, or nakedness, or peril, peril, or sword, just as it is written. This is interesting, in the midst of what won't separate you from God's love. For your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's a, actually a prophecy from the Old Testament. That sounds kind of strange. All this stuff's gonna, not going to separate us from God's love, but we're like sheep being slaughtered day after day. Why did he put that in between these verses? Well, because no matter what happens, it's like the, Paul wrote and he said, you know, no matter what happens circumstantially, even if you die, even if you die, and here's a newsflash, you will eventually, if you're killed, that doesn't separate you. From God's love that doesn't separate you from God's love but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord 
Amen? So what's going to separate you from God's love? Nothing. Listen to me carefully. The value in this, there's value in coming here today and hearing it. There is. Faith comes by hearing the word, right? There's way more value in you taking this with you. Because about Wednesday or Thursday, maybe tonight or tomorrow, and the doubts start creeping in and you hear the bad news and more bad news comes your way and somebody else is sick and somebody else died and, you know, on and on and on. And just, it's so easy for worry and fear to take over you. And your peace leaves when that happens. So what I'm saying is take this stuff with you. This is your prescription. This is medicine for your soul. And it absolutely works. Now listen carefully. I'm not saying to you, hey, read it once or twice. You know, it's like take one of these in the morning and call me. It's not what I'm saying. Something in here probably spoke to you. And some of it, maybe it didn't. And you're like, yeah, that's pretty good. But there was something that we covered today that it's like the Lord said, that's for you. You need this. Or your neighbor needs this. That person you work with needs this. That person you used to go to school with needs this. Your friend needs this. Your co-worker, that person that lives by themselves, they need something. They need this. The value in this tool is when you pray it. You say, God, your word says in James 4, 8, that if I draw near to you, you will draw near to me. So, Lord, best I understand, I'm drawing near to you right now. So I trust that the second half of that, which you said, is true. Jesus, you said that you'd never leave me nor forsake me. So I'm standing on that regardless of what's happening. You said you'd never change. I believe you. I may not understand you, but I believe you. You said don't fear, but pray. So you know what I'm doing? That's what I'm doing. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. Guys, what's easy to do is to, is to miss this, and that is, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. And it's kind of like, well, I'd never do that. But again, if we spend the bulk of our time on media and, you know, the news, even things that we think are conservative and line up with our views, the best of that is not the same thing as God's Word. So what I'm telling you is, please soak in God's Word. Let God's Word get into you. Let it get in your mind. Let it get in your heart. Repeat it over and over to God. Pray it back to God. Ask him, what does this mean? What does this look like? Here's what happens. As you do that over time, a strange thing begins to take place. One thing is, again, your thinking changes. The other thing is you're memorizing it. You're committing it to memory. So what that means is while you're driving down the street and people are going crazy, you don't have your Bible to pick it out and go, where was that at? You know, it's, it's in your heart. So you can call on it right there. You're at night, it's dark, you don't want to disturb the people around you, and so you're afraid, you can't go to sleep, so you recall, oh yeah, this is what God says. You're at work, and you can't just pull off the side and pull out a Bible and try to look up whatever, So, but it's okay because it's already in your heart. And on, and on. these are the kind of people we need to become. For ourselves, yeah but also for the people around us. I'm so glad you came today. I really hope that you'll take these things and that you'll put them into practice because if you do, you will see great things happen in your life. You will see peace. You will see freedom. You will experience joy. Joy in the midst of all this craziness. How is that possible? Because it doesn't come from you. It comes from Him. He'll give it to you. You have to seek it, though. You have to seek Him. I'm going to turn this over to my good friend Rob. I'm going to pray for you real quick as he comes, and then we're going to close down today. Father, thank you so much for what you've shown us through your Word. And all we did was take a couple of minutes and just look. We just scanned the surface of just a few things. But man, what we looked at are so powerful, so true, so helpful. Please give us the wisdom to realize there is wisdom in seeing this and hearing this maybe for the first time. There's a lot more wisdom in taking these tools with us and beginning to just look them up and ponder them. Meditate on what these truths actually say. 
and experience the healing balm that they bring, Father. The peace and the joy and the victory that they can have in our lives and in the lives of the people that we share these truths with. 